boom and we are back with assassin's creed origins uh working on the discovery tour uh we only got two left we got daily life which seems pretty long it's like the longest one it's got 20 and then romans so um let's kick this off and let's see what we learned today so if you're just jumping in um this is the expansion of Assassin's Creed Origins, not actually the game itself. Uh, this was built in order to uh, facilitate learning for university students. And I thought it was super cool that I decided to like immortalize it by putting it on YouTube. Playing through, because it's so educational. Welcome to Osiris, the first mummy. Oh, here we go. Where we get our learn on. The oldest mummies recovered date from the Old Kingdom, though Egyptologists believe that mummification was in use much earlier than that. At first, the body was mummified through environmental desiccation by leveraging the dryness of the environment and the heat of the climate. Early experimentations in mummification were conducted with the use of resin made from tree sap. Oh, that's kind of cool. Strips of linen were only used on some superficial parts of the epidermis of the hands or jaw. Epidermis equals skin. Um, yeah, some of these some of these were kind of boring. Like we passed over the uh, pyramid section. I don't like the architecture. I'm only into like the. Ideologically, the will to preserve the body the is not explained in any way until 3600 BCE. This is when the Egyptian belief that the body housed the soul was finally documented for modern Egyptologists to eventually decipher. It was not until the arrival of the myth of Osiris in the Egyptian religion around the fifth dynasty that mummification was thoroughly conceptualized. The practice was thereafter grounded in both a mythological and ideological point of view. Well, that's kind of cool. Osiris was mainly known as the god of the dead and the god of resurrection. The most well-known Genesis myth concerning Osiris is that of his dismemberment. Okay. It is Plutarch who gives the most simplified and complete summary of the story. Within Egyptian mythology, Osiris represented the first king to rule Egypt. Jealous of his power, his brother Seth attempted to usurp his throne. After several unsuccessful attempts, Seth succeeded in killing his brother by dismembering him and scattering the pieces of his body all over Egypt. Iset, the great of magic, traveled all over Egypt in search of the pieces of her husband's body. After a long search, she recovered all the pieces save for his manhood, as it was eaten by a fish. Huh, okay. Uh, you know, I actually uh, picked up one of these uh, Egypt books and read some of their myths. They're not as entertaining as like Greek mythology, but I guess because Egypt is like the oldest one of the three Romans, uh, Egyptians and Greeks, um, it's probably why it's, it's not as entertaining. Because nobody had the- Iset then reassembled the body of her husband by binding it together with strips of linen. Aided by her sister Nephthys, another powerful magician, they gave Osiris the breath of life. This not only brought him back from the dead, but also allowed him to recover his virility long enough to impregnate Iset, thus ensuring his succession before, once more, dying. Thus Horus was born. Oh, that's cool. Fascinating. Well. The ritual used to bring Osiris back to life essentially depicts how he became the first mummy it is why, on the Sarcophagi of Kings, we often find Iset and Nephthys represented as the magicians who restore life to the deceased. Oh, that's cool. Resurrection story. That's job. wonder if they, uh, it's, it's almost like every story got built upon one another. You know what I mean? Like, you, you have these resurrection stories across multiple different uh, religions, most notably, like, Catholicism. Like, we have this fear of the unknown, like, where are we going to go when we die? It's like, there's plaguing questions. Uh, if, 
you ever uh, want to check out a good book, Perennial Wisdom by, no, Perennial Philosophy is called, by Aldous Huxley. Um, he, like, puts all of the uh, religions together and then, like, shows you their commonality. It's a good book. Difficult to read, though. It takes a bit of time. Welcome to Mummies of Ancient Egypt. The mummification process used by ancient Egyptians was highly ceremonial in nature. The different types of mummification took into account the social level and richness of the deceased and even included animals. The most expensive was that reserved for the pharaoh and the royal family, as well as some of the wealthiest members of the court. The first step was cleaning. Once bodies arrived at the mummification site, they were placed on inclined tables while the bodily fluids drained away. Ooh. They were then cleansed by priests until they were deemed ready for the purification process. It's like prayers? What's going on? The purification of the body began with a libation from sacred water. The priest then fumigated the body with terebinth resin. After the ritual cleansing, priests used oils, spices, and all kinds of essences to further purify the body of the deceased. Finally, all body hair was meticulously removed. Meticulously, okay. Once the body was properly purified, embalmers removed the organs following very specific procedures. First, the brain was extracted by inserting a spoon through the nostril oh, to break the ethmoid bone. Then using a spatula, the pieces of the brain were removed as thoroughly as possible. What matter remained was extracted after a process of liquefaction, achieved through the use of a caustic liquid. The cranial box, once emptied, was rinsed and disinfected with palm wine, and then stuffed with strips of linen cloth and liquefied resin. Okay then. After taking care of the brain, embalmers made an incision on the left flank and carefully set aside the viscera. The inside of the body was also rinsed with palm wine. Then the embalmers filled the belly with pure myrrh, cinnamon, and other perfumes and sewed it shut. The removed viscera were washed in palm wine and packed in crushed herbs before being placed in canopic jars. That's, this is pretty interesting. Kinda cool, okay. Canopic jars were placed close to the sarcophagus or kept in a chest nearby. At first, the viscera were wrapped in tissue and placed in the vases. As the ritual requirements became more elaborate, ointments, spices, and even water and natron were added to the process. I wonder if they put all that stuff in for smell. Towards the middle of the New Kingdom, canopic jars assumed the appearance of the four sons of Horus. They were known as the protectors of the viscera. These protectors had their own guardians each a goddess of the dead. Imseti, the human-headed god, protected the liver and was protected by the goddess Iset. Happy, the baboon-headed god, protected the lungs and was protected by the goddess Nephthys. Dumuthef, the jackal-headed god, protected the stomach and was protected by the goddess Neith. And finally, Kebisenuef, the falcon-headed god, protected the intestines and was protected by the goddess Selkat. Hmm. But I mean, like, we do this kind of stuff already. Like, I'm not already, but like, still to this day. You know, if you've ever been to a funeral, you'll, you'll see something similar. Just they're not wrapped. Natron is a naturally occurring mineral found in evaporite. These sedimentary rocks are made up of mineral salts and were generally mined from lake beds in Egypt. Cool. Embalmers used natron as a desiccant to dry the flesh and stop the corpse's putrefaction process. Hmm. Once the body was cleansed and eviscerated, the deceased was covered in natron for about 40 days. Whoa, that's a long time. Once desiccated, the body was prepared to be wrapped in strips of linen. Okay. Once the body was fully desiccated by the natron treatment, Embalmers oiled, painted, and sometimes even added hair extensions or a wig. They often used a henna-based antiseptic preparation to give the body a more colorful and lively appearance while preparing it to resist molds and fungi. 
Wow, death metal, lots of these people. Next came the phase which gave mummies their most well-known appearance, the wrapping. Originally, each part of the body was wrapped separately. Men had their arms crossed on their chests, while women had the right arm folded over their breasts and the left arm stretched along the body. However, techniques evolved over time. Eventually, the body as a whole was wrapped with limbs alongside the body, and increasingly sophisticated and different techniques of weaving flax bands were developed. In addition to the jewelry and amulets arranged on the skin of the deceased, amulets were also carefully inserted into the weaving of the linen strips. Each amulet was linked to a myth, or to an ideological belief related to rebirth. Hmm. Masks were an important part of a mummy's finery. Early wooden funeral coverings were very expensive, however, and soon replaced by masks created through a technique known as cartonage. Masks fashioned with this method were created by laying several layers of linen or papyrus pulp on a base made of mud or straw. Cartonage was used for more than funerary masks. Ornaments and the animal coffins of the late period were also made in such a fashion. Cartonage evolved to cover the entire body of the mummy during the 22nd dynasty. The mummies were placed on a board inside a rigid envelope of cartonage, which was laced at the back with a string. Extremely cost-effective and visually pleasing, this technique was very popular through all layers of the society. Hmm. Cartonage envelopes were usually covered with inscriptions and polychrome decorations, specifying the names and titles of the deceased, scenes depicting daily life, or decorations specific to the funerary world. This was a true gift for Egyptologists eager to study the funerary rites of the ancient Egyptians. Fascinating stuff. Once the mummy was properly wrapped and adorned, the embalmers proceeded with the ceremony of the opening of the mouth. A vital step of the funerary process, this ceremony was meant to bring back to life the deceased themselves, or an object representing the deceased. Okay, so the soul will transfer. Interesting. There were no less than 75 different stages for the opening of the mouth. It required the application of the same oils, ointments, spices, and perfumes used during the mummification process. Makeup was sometimes part of the process as well. They, they did not take this procedure lightly. It's meant a lot to them, apparently. The last stage of this long ritual was the act of touching the mouth with the ads to symbolically allow the breath of life to infuse an inert body. Its performance was reserved for a very specific set of people. Priests who wore the mask of the god Anubis, a close relative of the family, or by the heir to the throne. Hmm. But I mean, I bet you none of these people came back to life. So, yeah. Oh, do we not finish this one? We did finish it, but it didn't turn. Importance of mummies. Why were they so important? So why did they keep all these people way past their death? It's interesting because it's like, there's probably no, there's no like evidence of what they were doing being correct. It was just for them to um, subdue their own like anxiety. Oh, look at that crocodile. That's crazy. Welcome to The Importance of Mummies. The first hieroglyph for embalmer appeared in pyramid texts of the Old Kingdom. It is likely that embalming was a trade that progressed alongside the evolution of ancient Egyptian funeral practices. While we still know nothing of how embalming came to be a profession, we do know that embalmers had a hierarchy and that each embalmer 
specialized in a specific phase of the mummification process. Interesting. The mummification techniques were jealously guarded by embalmers from generation to generation. Despite their efforts, Herodotus and Diodorus discovered their methods in late antiquity, but historians were skeptical about the validity of the texts. It remained a mystery until two teams of modern medical legal scientists confirmed the process in 1994 and again in 2011. Hmm. So they closely guarded their trade secrets. Makes sense. The Uabet, meaning the pure place, was where the embalmers mummified the bodies of the deceased. Until the end of the Middle Kingdom, it was located in tent. Oh no, ah oh, darn. The pharaoh had access to the most elaborate That's of fine. mummification rituals. The richer citizens of Egypt also enjoyed complex embalming options, though none of them allowed for the removal of the brain or viscera. After purifying the body, embalmers injected a liquid through the rectum, sealed it, and allowed the mixture to settle. Okay. They then plunged the body into natron for up to 40 days. Once the body was dried, the seal was removed, and the entrails flowed out with the injected liquid, leaving the skin and bones of the deceased to be wrapped in linen and returned to the family for burial. I wonder if they use like acid or something. The least costly embalming option was for the embalmers to simply inject a product called surmaya and immerse the body in the natron for up to 40 days before handing it over to the family. For all those who could not afford any embalming process, desert burials offered a pauper's alternative to preserve the bodies of the dead. Hmm. Egyptian civilization has always appealed to Westerners, even before the Greek and Roman invasions. As early as the Middle Ages, mummies discovered by travelers were often sent back to Europe. Curio cabinets, dating from the 16th and 17th centuries, usually included pharaonic artifacts in their collections. The Egyptomania phenomenon was heralded by Napoleon Bonaparte's Egyptian campaign, which lasted from 1798 to 1802. The following years were marked by a resurgence of interest from rich enthusiasts and scholars who exposed Egypt to the general populace. Oh, By 1868, mass tourism yeah, began in there. Egypt like, eh, under right. the aegis of the Cook Agency. The rich would indulge in leisure trips to Egypt and bring back mummies. Upon their return, they would organize evenings that consisted of unpacking mummies and removing strips of linen and amulets layer by layer. These were considered the shining cultural events of the season. The Egyptian collections of many a museum were founded as a consequence of this mass pillaging. <laughs> okay. That's fascinating. Yeah, I know. Thanks to those dubious parties, the fantasy of a mummy coming back to life, seeking revenge on its defilers, was born. The mummy malediction myth has remained steady in popular culture ever since, particularly in written media and cinema. Yeah, that's true. I feel that. Amulets and rituals. Yeah. These are okay. We'll see. Maybe it gets more and more fascinating over time. Uh, amulets and rituals. Like, I get it. You guys should place a lot of emphasis on your dead. So... Yeah. The culture with the uh, most the highest separation anxiety, the award goes to these people. Oh, fine thread will be there. Around one's neck, thread will break as the one's neck will be because of the enlargement, thyroid mass here. Wow, that's interesting. Pregnancy test. I don't know if that works now. Welcome to Amulets and Rituals. Ancient Egyptians believed the world was a chaotic place, filled with supernatural forces. They knew that art and words gave life and power to things. 
mind. Carved with images from hieroglyphs or in the shapes of gods, amulets were highly personal objects that warded off dangers and disease while attracting success. Placebo effect. Some amulets were temporary, intended to solve a specific problem, while others were meant to be worn forever into the afterlife. Yep. It's all about what you think. Somatoform disorder. Priests would infuse amulets with magical energy during religious ceremonies, imbuing them with protective magic to safeguard against supernatural powers. The wealthiest of Egyptians could obtain a divinely ordained pendant in which was hidden a magic formula inscribed on a piece of papyrus. It would act as a unique spell tailored to the owner. Here's a thought experiment for you. If you didn't know that they had blessed it, would you still feel the consequences? If not, placebo. Religion was so important to ancient Egyptians that it permeated every aspect of their daily lives. Since water was the source of life and had the symbolism of purifying the body and the soul, all daily routines began with a... Oh, no. I'll do there routine. was a complete wait, calendar wait, hold up, hold up, hold up, of each of the religious days. I want to hear that one. Religion was so important to ancient Egyptians that it permeated every aspect of their daily lives. Since water was the source of life and had the symbolism of purifying the body and the soul, all daily routines began with ablutions. Personal prayers to the gods were sometimes written or spoken, with family prayers passed down through generations. Cool. Now you can play this. There was a complete calendar of each of the religious days, both good and bad, illustrating the appropriate daily rituals. Along with wine, milk, and ointments, offerings to the gods consisted of small amulets to life-size statues and family shrines. During the Greco-Roman period, offerings to the gods consisted of mummified animals, Cats for Bostet, dogs for Anubis, and birds for Thoth. Deemed messengers of the gods, oracles offered guidance and judgment for all Egyptians, regardless of status. Crucial advice was offered on everything from day-to-day -day farming management to a pharaoh's decision on whether to start a war. Oracles were often used to decide legal issues if the accused refused the judgment of the god, another god could be consulted in hopes of a more... Was, oh, it was oracles more, that guided the Greek sailor Bot... In hopes of a more... Oh, no. Deemed messengers of the gods, Sorry, oracles guys. offered guidance and judgment for all Egyptians, regardless of status. I'll work on that. Crucial advice was offered on everything from day-to-day -day farming management to a pharaoh's decision on whether to start a war. Oracles were often used to decide legal issues. If the accused refused the judgment of the god, another god could be consulted in hopes of a more favorable reply. Huh. Uh. That's pretty funny. It was oracles that guided the Greek sailor Batos to the coast of Libya, where he founded a colony known as Cyrene. During Alexander the Great's campaign to conquer Persia, he consulted the oracle at the temple of Amun, within the oasis of Siwa, and was subsequently ordained a divine being. Cool. Wow, so much belief into spiritual supernaturalism. Um, temples, rituals, ancient Egypt. Here we go. Strange bedfellows. Royal baby food. Wow. Pre chewed the food. Oh, check for poison. That makes sense. Oh my god, 40, 70 days. That's crazy. Blood and bricks. Welcome to Temples and Rituals of Ancient Egypt. 
During rituals and festivals, the god was carried on a solar barge between the areas of a temple or the temples of different cities. Funerary carvings and paintings covering thousands of years, as well as the Book of the Dead, depict the same ship and ore design. Solar barges have been uncovered near or within several pharaoh's tombs. They were intended to carry the pharaoh into the afterlife. Ancient Egyptians believed that Ra, the sun god, traveled the skies in a boat known as the solar barge. The solar barge was believed to cross over to mythological lands. Okay. It's kind of random. The god Ra believed mankind was conspiring against him. He ordered Sekhmet, the lion-headed war goddess, to kill all humans. Wow. To his chagrin, Ra quickly realized that with all humans gone, there would be no one left to worship him. <laughs> In order to stop the rampaging Sekhmet, beer was brewed and dyed red with pomegranate juice to resemble blood. Sekhmet drank every drop of the brew she could find eventually passing out drunk. When she awoke, she was calmer, and her lion visage had changed into Bastet. The festival of drunkenness was celebrated in honor of that myth. That's ridiculous. Unlike the daily rituals that took place in the temple and were performed by priests, festivals allowed the entire population of the city to participate. Festivals helped mark the passing of the seasons in the agricultural calendar. In reflecting the cycles of life, festivals offered a sense of consistency and structure for the regular citizens, thus reinforcing the sense of order that pharaohs were to provide for the citizens of Egypt as part of their godly duties. Hmm, you know, that kind of just shows you that um, the, the strongest people in society back before there was the internet or the storytellers, because if you could sell a story, you could sell an idea, you could sell options for The importance of these festivals is demonstrated by their longevity. Records show that Osiris festivals occurred for more than 2,000 years. Some festivals serve to reinforce state control and promote the king's reign. Both the Opet and Sed Jubilee festivals were specifically intended to celebrate the renewal of the king's power. Cool. The temple hierarchy consisted of high priests, several types of priests, scribes, and servants. The high priest was known as the prophet. Some divinities had up to four prophets, and they were the ones to perform the most advanced and complex rituals. Hmm. The prophets. Egyptian priests were not confined to solely religious tasks, and in fact had crucial roles in Egypt's administration, most of which served to reaffirm the pharaoh as the proper vessel for the gods. Their focus within the temple was centered on the proper conduct of daily divine rituals, rather than as custodians of dogma or the indoctrination of individuals. Hmm. That's cool. Scribes were custodians of the sacred sciences. Some priests were associated with the funeral rites and were considered the group with medical knowledge. The servants of the Ka were low-ranking priests who carried food and offerings in funerary rituals. Lector priests were distinguished by their ability to read and their main duty was to recite specialized religious texts in both temple and funerary rituals. That's cool. That's cool. Priests and all the officials who served the temple worked only three months a year, with each period separated by a quarter of inactivity, Ooh, at least job. within the temple compound. Each outgoing group handed over the temple and their tools to the newcomers. Only the high priesthood remained in permanent office within the temple. Sounds like a crush position. The most sacred part of the temple was referred to as Jesser Jesseru, the Holy of Holies. The most sacred inner sanctuary was where the shrine to the temple deity was located. Only priests were allowed within. Offerings were given and rituals unseen by even the pharaoh were performed. 
While the team chose to allow any character access to this space in some game temples, normally it was reserved for priests alone. Cool. Pharaohs and their priests often chose the site of these sacred temples because of some mythological connection or an alignment with the cardinal points and certain stars. Once selected, a foundation ritual was performed. The pharaoh was required to complete 10 steps in the ritual, which required a mix of offerings as well as specific construction techniques. Once the temple was complete, construction of the chamber containing the shrine or naos began. Wow. How do they know all that astrological stuff? That's crazy. The naos was where the god statue stood. The representation of the deity was usually in stone or wood and decorated with gold, silver, and precious stones. Smaller temples had only one naos, while larger complexes such as the Temple of Karnak had many chambers to honor gods, such as Amun, Ta, and Osiris. Each statue was believed to be a receptacle for the presence or essence of the god's Ka, enabling it to take a physical form. Through the statue, the god came to the shrine to eat, drink, and communicate with the pharaoh, or with the priests standing in for the pharaoh. That's cool. I feel that. I feel that. Okay, let us do... Maybe we'll just do one last one for today. It's a lot of heavy-duty information. All right, we'll do this. Temples and priests. I feel like it's like reading a chapter in a book, you know what I mean? Because there's so much heavy-duty information that gets shot your way that you're like, okay, I'm going to take it. Take it slowly, you know? Don't want to just gorge in all that information. Modern Alexandria Library. Wait, what? Copy of all the web pages on every website on the internet. Since wow! Oh, that's kind of cool. All the web pages on every website. No way. Good facts, good facts. Tour. Welcome to Temples and Priests. From its foundation, the city of Memphis favored worship of the god Ta. The main temple of Ta was wow. known as Hutkapta meaning Palace of the Ka of Ta. The name of the temple, translated into Greek as Egyptos, would eventually evolve into the modern name Egypt. Oh, that's kind of interesting, Egyptos. Temples were the center of religious, political, and economic life in ancient Egypt. These sacred places were viewed as the literal home of the gods and goddesses. As such, Every aspect of them required care and reverence, all of which was accomplished through elaborate ritual. Makes sense. Located in the center of Memphis, the Temple of Ta was the most prominent and imposing building in the city. The long walkway leading toward the temple, known as the Dromos, was guarded by rows of sphinxes. The entire sacred area was designed to keep the statue of the god protected deep within the sacred enclosures that surrounded it. Hmm. The Dromos opened into a courtyard with the surrounding portico graced with columns carved to resemble palm trees. During special festivals, the general population was allowed to enter this location, but under no circumstances would they be allowed into the sacred spaces beyond the courtyard. Uh -huh. Gotta keep that a secret. So, if you have, like, nothing set up except for deity protection, if, like, an army comes through, do you just get slaughtered? You know? Like that scene in, uh, Troy, when, uh, Achilles cut the head off of the, um, the sun god and was like, come at me, bro. Think about it. The Memphis Alabaster Sphinx was discovered in 1912, almost completely buried in water and sand. Eight meters in height and weighing in at roughly 90 tons, it is still mounted on its original pedestal. Though it is called the Alabaster Sphinx, 
it was in fact carved from common calcite rock, which is similar in appearance. Oh, uh, whatever. Erosion has destroyed the original engravings, making it difficult to determine when it was created. Egyptologists believe that its facial likeness resembles Amenhotep II, and so it could have been sculpted somewhere between 1700 and 1400 BCE. Technically, they don't know what he looks it like. It is believed that this monument once stood outside of the Temple of Ta and was integrated into subsequent extensions to the complex. Maybe. The size of the imposing sculpture reflects the importance it had to the temple during the New Kingdom. This sphinx is one of the few remaining artifacts from the ruins of Memphis to survive. That's kind of cool. In Egyptian culture, some animals were associated with gods, while others were considered to be living gods. The Apis bull was believed to be a divine entity. The earliest mention of the Apis bull in ancient Egypt goes back as far as the first Egyptian dynasty. Probably because the bull offered you so much uh, in return, like they're such a utility, so if you make it sacred, nobody will kill them. Originally the symbol of fertility, the Apis bull was linked to the god Ra, with the image of the sun carried between its horns. Later it was associated with Osiris, the ruler of the underworld, thus becoming the funerary divinity Osorapis. During the 18th dynasty in Memphis, the Apis bull's association with the city's deity earned it the title Herald of Ta. The Apis bull was so revered that even Alexander the Great, upon his arrival in Memphis, gave honor to Apis. Cool, cool. The Apis bull lived with its harem in a sacred barn located in an enclosure in the Temple of Ta. Each bull bore 29 signs representative of its divinity. Among them, the bull had an eagle-shaped mark on its back, a double tail hair, and a scarab-shaped mark under the tongue. The signs were intended to correspond with the lunar cycle. After its death, Egyptians would search for its reincarnated form among the livestock. Hmm. Imagine being one of those sacred animals and you're like, what are you guys doing to me right now? But they're probably like happy that they're not being slaughtered, so. Like other living divinities, the mortal incarnation of the Apis bull was prayed to, and when it died, it was given a luxurious funeral, which included mummification. Until the reign of Ramses II, the Apis bulls were buried in individual graves in Saqqara. During the 26th dynasty, the bodies of the bulls were buried in enormous stone vats in the underground corridors of the Serapium of Memphis. Talk about respect. Okay. Ancient Egyptians believed that temple rituals were essential to maintain order in the cosmos and allow communication between humans and gods. The pharaoh was required to bring offerings as part of a twofold promise made to the gods to remain a just ruler and to prevent chaos from entering Egypt. Okay, more belief. Details of the ceremonies found on temple walls provide a thorough overview of the stages of the daily ritual. Performed three times a day to mirror human mealtimes, each step of the highly symbolic ceremony was accompanied by specific recitations, many of which referred to mythical events. The high priest would first awaken the sleeping god with a chant. Then the seals of the shrine's doors were broken and the bolts drawn back. The act of swinging open the doors was a symbolic gesture where sight was granted to the deity. The priest would then bow and kiss the ground. Okay, okay. Giving him that respect. The god was then washed with incense-infused water and its mouth rinsed with mineral salts. The cleansing was followed by adorning the statue with jewels and royal garments. The final ritual required the priest to sweep away any footprints in order to prevent evil from approaching the god. Okay, I guess going off. All right. 
Heredity was the primary source of new recruits. Rarely was an outsider allowed this position. At the top of the temple hierarchy was the high priest. Each temple dedicated to a god had at least one high priest devoted okay, so to basically they just kept everything in. High house. priest candidates made their way up the ranks of the temple hierarchy. The one chosen to occupy the lofty position of high priest was usually confirmed by the pharaoh. Several of the high priests were also important officials in the government. Mm, okay, so priests. In the 21st dynasty, Thebes on. became the capital of an almost entirely theocratic government. The city was headed by king priests who spoke and governed in the name of the god Amun, in open opposition. Okay, so, what we've learned. The educational institution in ancient Egypt was known as the House of Life. Attended by the offspring of the elite and the clergy, it was a place tailored to the social status of its attendees. The earliest references to this type of institution date back to royal decrees of the Old Kingdom. So basically what we've learned is that um, priests are able to uh, manipulate the system because they were regarded so highly and they had high positions of power and they spoke directly to the um, the pharaoh. So these were the elites of the time, basically. <laughs> Only two known centers have been uncovered. One in the abandoned city of Akhetaten, okay. and one at the temple of Ramses the... It's not so interesting, I get it. The House of Life on. offered training for the elite, destined for occupations such as astronomers, doctors, veterinarians, so the diplomats, okay. architects, translators. They had universities back then. And Not limited to instruction for young students, the House of Life was a source of reference for many scholars, with rooms dedicated to papyri of many disciplines. Because papyri were preserved there, the Greco-Romans referred to the House of Life as a library. Hmm. Okay, makes sense. Ancient Egyptian economy was based on an unequal system of redistribution of goods. The state Trickle of Egypt economics. collected the crops and the temples distributed them throughout the provinces. Since the only people capable of counting and ensuring a fair redistribution were the educated scribes, this meant that the temples played a pivotal role in this process. Mm, but we have to trust that they weren't, um, they would never succumb to human emotion uh, or greed mainly, and would keep everything fair. Yeah. There are records of pharaohs making offerings of large tracts of land and animals to temples in order to maintain their favor. Yeah. Ramses... Okay, bribes. Palaces, warehouses, and granaries were built inside the temple compound to better control the redistribution of goods. The size of the recorded numbers of goods combined with every other function filled by temples, only serves to confirm their might as economic, religious, and political centers of power within Egypt. Okay, so basically what we learned uh, in this chapter, this is a very telling chapter, that's why we spent through it, it's like, okay, this, this makes sense. Uh, it's all about corruption. Well, room for corruption, they never specifically outed the corruption, but um, there's the opportunity to uh, hijack the system by becoming a priest and the wealthy will stay wealthy and the middle class will stay middle class and the poor will stay poor not like today so that's all we have uh until next time stay hungry stay smart educate yourself this is a pretty good one but i got what was going on in that one i'm more interested in well it is pretty interesting it's, it's still really good just i got i got the gist but yeah uh, so we'll continue this, hopefully polish it off next time, and uh, yeah, we'll see what other walkthrough we got in the future. <coughs> Till next time, take it easy. Bye-bye. <coughs>